Welcome. Uh, so, welcome to the NOC report. This is our ninth annual NOC report. Um, we'll just jump right into it because we've got a lot to cover. First, we'll start introducing ourselves. Hi, my name is Neil Weiler, but um, everyone in the information security community knows me as Grifter. Uh, by day, I am the global lead of active threat assessments for IBM X4, so I handle X Force's uh, hunting practice around the world. And by night, I do this. Um, this is my 21st year running the Black Hat Network uh, with my partner in crime, Bart, here. Um, but I also do other things like uh, when we finish up immediately after this and pack up this network, I'll run down the street where I run all the contests and events at DEF CON. Um, I don't know, I always say, like, I speak at conferences around the world. I wrote a couple books, all things that make my mama proud. At least one of us made her mom proud. So I am, uh, I'm Bart. I'm the other partner in crime. Uh, I love going second because it's always just a shorter list. We knock it out. I've been doing this about 15 years with Thrifter. Uh, during the day, I'm a senior SE at NetWitness. Uh, I've done a few things. I actually got done doing DEF CON. This will be the first year I'm not gooning, so just going to hang out. Maybe, maybe see some of you there. Um, yeah, been around and doing this bit now. Cool. Hi, I'm Bart, and I have no accomplishments. I mean, uh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's my best friend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it is. Sometimes. Um, no. so, so obviously we don't do this by ourselves. Um, there is actually a fairly large team behind us. This is the Knot Crew. So the Knot Crew is made up of myself, Bart, and our principal architect, Steve Fink, and then also 15 of our closest friends who are security professionals in their day job and volunteer their time to come out and spend a week plus with us setting this up and trying to keep the network stable and secure. Um, we also have partners. So here are our partners. Bart, you want to introduce them? Yeah, so our NOC partners, you'll hear that word a lot. I'll touch that here real quick. NOC, NOC partners are just that. They're partners. They are not sponsors. Uh, we select these partners to be in the NOC based on the equipment and people that they provide and what we need to provide the solution here at Black Hat. So real quick, these partners, uh, NetWitness, Cisco, I'll tell you who they are real quick and I'll tell you what they do. Corelight, Palo, Arista, Lumen, you know most of them. Lumen provides us two 10 gig circuits that we use here for bandwidth. Uh, Arista this year is providing us with our switching uh, access points and tap aggregation. Palo Alto provides our firewalls uh, and securing that. Corelight provides uh, network, uh, excuse me, network detection and response. Cisco provides us all of our MDM that we have on the iPads and iPhones that are around registration and lead retrieval. Uh, they also provide us with the malware sandbox. I still call it Threat Grid. They probably don't like that. I always forget the name. Uh, Secure X, right? Secure X. Threat Grid it is. Threat she fine. said it. It's okay. Right. Cisco Pure just X. blessed it from the front I'll be nice. Row. I'll be good. Uh, and then DNS as well. And then NetWitness provides us with full uh, packets, logs, and identity provider as well. You crushed that, man. I'm good. I like See? this. I've done it before. Tear them down, build them up. It's, it's a toxic relationship. Tell me where my job is and where uh, they're. Keep yeah. going. Keep going. So what we've got from all these guys, uh, again, a big piece, guys and gals. I do that, and I've almost gotten canceled a few times this week. So um, what they provide us is the equipment as well as all the people. Everyone's great, uh, provides us all the expertise to what they run, but here's the gear that they run. Palo Alto brings a couple of firewalls, uh, some big ones we also run panorama on the side, and then a second that they actually capture traffic and just do analytics on. Uh, NetWitness brings a full stack. We actually have another box there that we run some um, virtualization on that we provide a few different servers for different uh, partners as well as internal stuff. Corelight with their AP5000 investigator. Cisco brings a whole bunch of gear as well. I won't read off all of that, and then Arista between the switches and access points. A lot of you have seen this before, and this is generally where the phones come out. So this is a uh, pretty simple layout of the network architecture. We are definitely a keep a simple, stupid uh, place. Try to keep it as simple as possible. Grifter and I are not very smart, and so when we have to look at things, we don't want to have to explain too much. Uh, so we make it as dumbed down as possible, but we also want that for troubleshooting and for reliability. Um, we've talked about being a knock. This comes up a bit. We're not. We don't call ourselves a SOC, we do security things, but our number one priority here is the stability of the network. So uh, making sure that you can do your labs and trainings, making sure that presenters can do their demos, making sure that people in Arsenal can demo their tools and show those things off, uh, and having a reliable network to do that on. So we do that um, 
by connecting all those beautiful devices together, as well as all the beautiful people who come with those devices and integrating them with one another to enrich whatever data that we're getting and hopefully inform the NOC and the folks within there to do just that. Keep the network stable is, is the first goal, and then secure is the second goal. And we do that by you know, passing all kinds of things to each other. Intelligence, uh, when there's an investigation, it'll be, oh, this, this device is gonna send you this, I'll get you this, and I'll show you what an investigation looks like here shortly. But um, all of these devices are tied together in, as Bart mentioned earlier, a partnership. We have competing platforms that are, that are there in the NOC, right? We've got Cisco working side by side with Palo Alto. We've got NetWitness side by side with Corelight, but they work together seamlessly. They do that for a couple of reasons. One, um, it, you form a different kind of relationship when you travel the world together and you're in the trenches with one another and you're like, yeah, let's help each other out and get things done. But also, um, because it actually helps make their solutions better. Over the years that we've been partnering with, um, with these different vendors, we've watched them look at one another and say, ooh, is that what that data looks like when I send it to you? And they're like, yeah, and they're like, I'm sorry. Um, we'll, we'll make it better. And then, and then by the next show, they have improved however that data flows from their device into other things, which I think is incredible because you get to watch these folks level up next to um, one another. And we often don't have networks that are just green fields, right? We don't get to create it from scratch. We have mergers, acquisitions, or we just get something that someone else was like, I like this gear, and a new manager comes in and is like, well, my nephew works for that company, so we're buying that now. <laughs> so we've got to make all these things work together, and we, and we do that fairly well. Um, I'm, I'm actually really proud of that. Ooh, dashboards. Dashboards. We've got a whole bunch of dashboards here we're going to kind of fly through, but these are some of the things that you'll see when you walk into the NOC. So we have the data that we are presenting to the people in the NOC, as well as Grifter and myself, to understand what's happening on the network. Um, that's all data that we look through, understand, and help utilize to troubleshoot and understand again when there's a problem there. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen that blinky pew pew map if you walked into the NOC and saw that. That's generally one of the ones that gets most of the questions. We talk about it and show it. Uh, that is an open source tool called OIP um, that is it. utilized and shows traffic from um, clients to servers. The dots represent the size of that packet, and then the color represents the protocol, so TCP, UDP, and ICMP. Um, green's TCP, red's UDP, and ICMP, and other is, is a, a white-ish. So dashboards, we've got a whole bunch here that we'll fly through and kind of show you that data, but these are all useful. Come by and see them, and it's definitely things that grow and change uh, from show to show for us. Yeah, it's kind of funny because, uh, like, whoa, well, how dare you? It wasn't me. At some point, we should all cheer really loud just to make the others feel bad. <laughs> um, so the dashboards are things that we get useful information out of. Also, they're there in the front of the NOC so that it's an educational exhibit, right? You can come in and take a look at what's going on and, um, and just kind of see what we're seeing. It, is informative, honestly, the more that Bart and I are like managing things, like we're, we find we like pretty colors even more. So we're like, pie chart is fun, me touchy. Um, and so, so the dashboards actually are really useful for us because we'll say, okay, what is that? Is that something we need to dig in further on? What information is this? Can you tell me more about why we're seeing this? Like it, it really does genuinely um, inform the knock. So actually um, a cruel joke. I'm colorblind and he tried to make all the colors. So it's, that's the real answer. I don't know what's happening. He, you I don't can't know. see whether it's TCP <laughs> or UDP. Um, yeah, so um, again, we just we have a ton of dashboards in there, all of them showing us like how much traffic we're getting at certain times of the day, when we see things drop off, like it actually informed us. We'll talk more about we had some issues with the network earlier in the week. Um, and some of them we could just clearly see a visual and go, something's wrong there. So we know that they're shiny and we know executives like them, but at times they can be genuinely useful. Um, more, more and more. I'm just going to keep going. There's a lot of them. I want to talk about that talk one about really one quick. Now. So this is actually um, a new piece. I didn't even mention this. We had Cisco Brink. So this is actually called Thousand Eyes. I, uh, by trade, started networking uh, before I got into the security side of house. And we used this a lot back in... Uh, just my network days doing BGP monitoring. 
This is actually very useful in what some of the things that we did here this year with some of the issues that we did have and we'll talk about. Uh, Thousand Eyes, we can put out probes across the venue, wired, wireless, and basically monitor uh, its connectivity, latency, throughput, um, the entire path from endpoint to server and see what that looks like and where that latency or issues may be uh, integrated. And I just wanted to kind of throw out a shout out. They helped quite a bit. Uh, and this was the first show that we had Thousand Eyes and we utilized it quite a bit. All right, so we have some, some KC stats for you. So I can't read anything on that screen. It's so tiny and I'm old. Um, but uh, the, some of the stats from, from this year, um, these are the different VPN types that are up here on the side, the count of how many connections we had from those types of, of VPNs. Um, we've also got the different uh, encrypted protocols that we saw, saw the most of. So we've still, uh, you can see TLS uh, 1.3 is, is doing great, but there's still just a little, little guy down there at the bottom, SSL v3, still holding on. Um, Again, so top networks by number of connections. The general Wi-Fi, of course, would be the one that probably gets hit the most. But I feel like that hacking and securing cloud infrastructure, they really gave it um, the old college try. Like, <laughs> they, they literally have um, roughly about half the number of connections in their training class as all of Black Hat um, briefings had for the two days. So. So they're, they're hammering away on it. Yeah, whoever, you, if you took that class, you're out there, good job, get after it. Um, and then just the types of networks and the IDS alerts that we were seeing from those networks. Um, again, cloud infrastructure coming in just under the general Wi-Fi for the number of alerts uh, that they were kicking off on, on IDS. More stats. So this is some of the uh, mobile device management. Again, Cisco provides that, and we have that on all of the devices that registration uses, as well as the lead retrieval devices. Uh, so you can see in here the amount of different devices that we had that we protected. Uh, and again, yeah, I can't read all of those uh, from there. But the amount of grayware sensitive data that we saw is that bottom left graph, uh, and then all of the file types that were submitted to SecureX. So yeah, because we have full packet capture, we can grab whatever files are coming across the network and dump them into that sandbox and see what they do, right? Does it potentially contain malware? And if it does, what kind of reaction does that have on the VM that it's in? And, um, and so that's a, it's a lot of submissions. 29,000 different files were submitted uh, to ThreatGrid, just checking them to see if there was anything in there. Sometimes they're not malicious files, but they are sensitive in nature. In the past, we've seen documents or different things come through and we're like, ooh, that's actually bad. And we have to tell people like, you're leaking your earnings reports before you've made them public or things like that. Or, hey, you just dumped your entire financial history onto the Black Hat Network. So, um, Happens like, more often than you le think. Like, le le legitimately, that was a thing, so. Um, ooh, DNS. DNS. So this is all of the stats that we get from Umbrella. Again, Cisco running that. Uh, you can see the amount of requests uh, that we get in the top left kind of year over year. Uh, those numbers that you have in the top right are actually the amount of different apps, the unique applications that we had on the network that were detected by ThreatGrid as well. Uh, so you can kind of see that year over year, how that changes, what it looks like. Um, 2021 wasn't, wasn't really the same. We don't count that, right? It was a little bit smaller, um, but we are well beyond pre-pandemic numbers, what we're seeing from there. So yeah. growth and we're coming back. All right, we do this slide um, every show and I'm gonna do it again, but I'll run through it quickly. Um, this is how the network is set up. So I mentioned that, um, that I've been doing this for 21 years, BART for about 15. Um, when I took over the network, it was a Cisco 2600 router and some Cisco access points that had Orinoco gold cards in them and we would tape the antennas up on the wall and it was a thing. Um, and it was me and two people and we ran the entire network. But the show was smaller than 1500 attendees. Uh, still not enough people to handle that, but we did all right. And the ultimate goal, the first goal, as we mentioned before, is stability. We wanna try to keep the network up and usable so that you can get on there and do whatever it is that you're doing, a demo, some type of, you know, uh, if you're in a training class and you need to do the labs, that kind of thing. And then after that comes security. So, right, then it's like, okay, well, how do we keep them from attacking each other? How do we monitor these things, all that stuff. So that just comes down uh, segmentation. We used to have classes where they could see each other and then the offensive classes would immediately attack the defensive classes, like immediately. Um, and, w and we'd have to go down there and be like, guys, oh, stop, like, or somebody from like the 
the policy class would come up and be like, we can't get on the internet. And we'd go look and we'd be like, oh, it's because the class next door is just like dosing you off the network. Um, also, people just learn things in these classes. Like you guys go out there and you take a training class and you're like, that's a cool tool or I've never thought of that technique before. And you just start firing it everywhere. And when I say everywhere, I don't mean just at each other. Every show we have to go and tell somebody that doing illegal things from the Black Hat Network is still illegal, right? So people will get on there and just be like, I learned something new, let me throw all of these attacks that I just figured out um, at some public website. One year it was a, this guy's hometown police department. He just went after the police precinct's website uh, with a vengeance. That web hacking class was really paying off. Um, and so... But he never got in, so... How he did, yeah, he did, but man, he was hammering on it. Um, and then you always hear things too about like, oh, Black Hat is one of the most hostile networks in the world. And that is true if you're looking at the data at face value, right? If you look at the types of data that is traversing the network, it is intensely malicious, right? It's the type of data that if you saw that in your corporate environment, you would be horrified by it. Um, your hair would turn white, or if you have gray hair already, it would fall out. Um, <laughs> We want to know if that was true back in the day. And we were like, is this, you hear all these things about Black Hat, how can we find out? And so we decided to do some hunting, right? And we, um, we at the time we brought in NetWitness, we started doing full packet capture and we started hunting in that data. And we were like, oh yeah, this is really bad. The thing about a network like this is we, and we say this over and over, in, when we go into our corporate jobs, we are searching for a needle in a haystack. And here at Black Hat, our folks in the NOC are searching for a needle in a needle stack. And they are looking for a needle that just shines a little bit different than the other needles. And when they see that, they dig in on it, right? So we brought hunting in to make sure that we could find those extra shiny needles because those were the things like people attacking the backend infrastructure, going after the registration server, attacking other attendees, attacking public sites and, and infrastructure. And it allowed us, because we could see that those were different from the normal bad traffic, to mitigate those attacks. Um, malware sandboxing naturally came with that. Uh, we actually met Jessica Bear from Cisco at RSA conference. And we formed a relationship there, and we're like, hey, we've already got all the packets, might as well grab the files out of there and chuck them in a sandbox and see what they do. We already mentioned that, so I'll move on. Uh, we did have a situation a few years ago where one of the partners with the best intentions because of vulnerability had been discussed about one of their devices on the stage earlier that day, got a quick patch made to patch some equipment and it ended up bringing the network to its knees for 90 minutes um, because there wasn't adequate testing done. Again, they didn't mean to do it, we understand that, but what it taught us was that no one should be able to make changes unless, um, unless their name is Grifter, Bart, or Fink. Um, and so we've got identity um, implemented by NetWitness as well. On the endpoint side, clearly we're not asking you to install anything, but we do have the mobile devices, we also have um, registration devices, laptops that we do rent from places, that kind of stuff. Anything that we um, do control, we put some kind of endpoint visibility into. And then after that, it was automation. The scale of the show, as I mentioned, my first show, 1,500 attendees. This show, something like 20 to 25,000, right? I don't know what the numbers are yet. But we used to run around to every classroom telling people like, hey, you're owned, or hey, there's a problem here, or this, you know, I see this type of activity. We still occasionally, just because it's fun, when someone is attacking a public site, we'll just open the door and we lean our heads in and we go, still illegal, and then we close the door and then the activity will stop. But sometimes we can't track those individuals down. And what implementing SOAR for us has done is allows us to scale our abilities to inform on clear text credentials, crypto mining activity, as well as um, anybody that seems like they're beaconing out to known malicious domains or C2. So I mentioned that people say that the Black Hat Network is really scary and it's really spooky and don't get on it and bring your burner phones and laptops, but in reality, we tell probably too many people that they have already come to the conference with a compromised device. And we can do that because we have the type of SOC that would 
you know, looks like a modern day sock should. It has all the bells and whistles. Now we're spoiled because we have unlimited budget. We get all of that for free because we're black hat and we can be like, can we play with your toys? And they're like, have our toys and some people. Um, we're just spoiled in that regard. But it does mean that people show up, they plug in, we see that activity and we let them know, hey, based on our intelligence, based on what you're doing, based on the investigation that the team has done, you're owned. Um, and you might wanna do something about that. And we can, if we can't chase them down, we'll send them a captive portal type of page through the Palo Alto, and it will say, hi, this is the knock, we saw this, you should take care of it. So it's nice to have the ability to do that when we can't be running from class to class. And I think this year there were 71 training classes going on at any given time. It's too much for us to be chasing down every little issue. Do you ever notice Magikarp doesn't evolve? He doesn't evolve, that's just to mess with them. So we talk about lessons learned rather often. And so we try to point out when we make mistakes as well as the other things that we learn. Uh, and we got one. <laughs> so um, we definitely have, have broken things before in the past. We definitely learn from those things. We take note of what that is. Uh, and this is one that could have possibly given us a problem, uh, but we've noticed it now and we've, uh, Noted, if you will. So, multicast DNS. Um, normally, you would never allow this to traverse uh, broadcast domains. Um, we noticed a little bit into the show that we had a whole bunch of multicast traffic, and in digging in a little bit more, that was actually some of our problems with the APs, but then that was also something that we dug into a bit more and noticed that we were actually allowing multicast DNS to traverse the networks within Black Hat. We were blocking that from leaving the network, so it didn't ever go out to the internet. Um, but if there was somebody that had a responder that was set up on one network, um, they may have been able to cause some problems for us, we will say. This has been noted, and hopefully it's not something that we will ever deal with again. Uh, but this is something that we got a little concerned about once we saw it, took steps to make sure that that was cleaned up, um, but we, we messed up. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually going to go back to this too and say, um, like, we messed up in other ways too. Like, was anybody in a training class on Monday? Anybody who was in a training class on Monday? So, I, as Grifter uh, Knock Lead, would like to formally apologize for some of you having network issues. There was a handful of classes that were essentially crippled as far as network um, reliability went. It wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Thank you for lying to me, I appreciate it. I'll give you 20 bucks later. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, it, was, it was difficult. And the reason that was is we were using new equipment that we normally try to burn in an international show, but we didn't have the opportunity to do that. And we brought it into this show, and unfortunately we had to learn lessons on site. So um, we knew some of the configuration changes we need to make, but again, unfortunately, we couldn't make those changes till the end of the day without bringing down the entire network for all 71 classes, registration, the sales office, the show office. So, no. um, so if you were in one of those classes, it was about 10% of the classes, my apologies. Um, so this is how we do an investigation. Uh, these guys don't know that I grabbed their stuff out of Slack. But I thought this was pretty funny because they're just like trying to work out if this is malware. It looks dodgy, right? And then it's like, oh, okay, looking at the response. I see this, I see this. This is how investigations happen, just in Slack. And these are different teams working with each other. It's, you know, we've got Cisco in there, Palo in there, CoreLight's in there, and they're all just sharing information about it. And then Wes, bless his heart, is like, this is how, <laughs> this is how Wes is trying to decode Base64. And then, um, you know, he's like, oh, sorry, went the long way around, and, uh, you know, it's like Cyber Chef, bro. But, um, but this is how, <laughs> this is how, this is how, <laughs> you shush him. But, um, but yeah, so it honestly is just us getting into a Slack channel with one another, a hunting channel that we have set up, and we say, this looks weird, can other people take a look at this? And that's how this happens in the real world, too. Like I said, I run the threat hunting practice for IBM X Force. This is what we do. We see things and we check with one another is this actually weird or am I just, you know, you know, off my rocker? So, Bart. Yay, we're gonna get into a few stories. We're gonna jump through some of these so you have some time for questions, but uh, story time. So, um, this was a whole bunch of ICMP traffic. That ICMP traffic looked a little innocuous in the sense of how 
large those packets were. Uh, we did a little bit of digging and we found that this was all actually HTTP traffic being sent over ICMP. The interesting thing about that, we've all heard, oh, you can exfiltrate that way, we still have to watch it, right? We talk about all that kind of stuff. The interesting thing was though, once digging around, it wasn't just to one server, there wasn't anything like that. It was talking to a huge number of servers over ICMP and those servers were actually responding. It was actually HTTP traffic inside of ICMP. So we dug in a little bit and saw how uh, unique that was in a sense, and it was just a whole bunch of servers that were responding. So whether that's a bug on the client actually allowing it to send it out and be that way, whether it was configured that way and it was something malicious, uh, we didn't get that far, but there was some pretty unique traffic in ICMP that was actually HTTP requests, and they were responding, so it was an echo request and it would actually respond with an echo response with the HTTP inside the ICMP packet. So that was actually unique. We'd love to see stuff like that. Uh, different things that we can take back to the day job and kind of show whether somebody was exfiltrating or something. Uh, it didn't appear to be here, but again, uh, the techniques and just what you can find, and we always talk about how unique this type of traffic is, and that was actually kind of cool to, uh, to see and what that looked like. Isn't ICMP useful? Yeah. Um, so we, I talked about reg and like, the sorry to blind you. Um, I talked about registration and the fact that that's one of the areas where if we see an attack on registration, we know that that's not something that's a class or a demo or whatever. These are the different types of attacks that we saw in registration this year. So um, there you go. I see you taking your picture. Gotta get that. Gonna look at that. I'm gonna try something new. Um, okay. So but yeah, that's, that's what we're up against just on reg, right? So. Um, Good times, obviously we love doing this or we wouldn't keep coming back, but um, those are some of the types of things that, that we're dealing with. Um, so we talk about in the industry, trust but verify. Jessica says don't trust, just verify, no trusting. Um, and a lot of the things that we see here, we're both involved with some of the RSAC stuff as well, but different things that we see at public conferences is all the different applications and cameras, and we'll talk about a few other things that are never encrypted. All of this flying uh, across in the clear, we'll have a few other examples of that too. So this was actually a caller ID application um, that can block like your scam calls and all that kind of stuff and do screening, um, but apparently between the application and the actual server, uh, everything was in FTP, so we could see everything that was coming across there. I don't know that's necessarily crazy sensitive that you get all the spam numbers, uh, but it's one of those things you never know if it's gathering other data and sending that back and just telemetry on you. Uh, that's all in the clear, so uh, verify, verify, verify. Never trust. Yeah, super weird. Um, this, the, I, this one I feel kind of bad about. Like um, I said, there's these. But, we, but, but some of the folks in the knock put puts together a graphic down there on the bottom and different stuff too. So this is an application, um, it's an Indian application for setting up arranged marriages essentially, right? So this is an app on some person's phone and this is all of the information in the clear, not only with his profile pictures but the profiles of the people that he was talking to, sending out things saying, hey, want to get married? Um, we could <laughs> see all the rejections that were coming in and I was like, ow, ow. Oh, reflective embarrassment, I can't. Um, but um, clearly not a reflective embarrassment enough to not make a damn slide out of it. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, lots of uh, pending things out there, but, um, but we got a hit. There's a, you know, there's a couple, a couple accepteds in there. So um, hopefully those aren't people trying to scam this poor guy. But again, applications on your devices that you think, and this is, I, this seems fairly sensitive. So um, it makes me sad to see that up there. But. And we'll continue the trend here with a couple more. So we have some more social media uh, applications that are in the clear here. Um, this one was somebody hanging around the conference. Uh, pictures were in the clear. I don't believe credentials were. No credentials, just everything else that was being sent. Um, we've seen that the opposite in some cases. I remember one year at RSAC, it fell over uh, Tinder, oh, yeah. it fell over Valentine's, and that was like when Tinder was first a thing. Basically, all of the swipes were in the clear. So your that was years ago. Be. They did fix it like they three did. weeks they did. before the next RSAC, but that was something that the uh, we help out with the RSA conference sock too, um, as well as Jessica down here. Um, and so that was something that we saw and let Tinder know about and they fixed it. But at the time it was like you could see like 
this guy really likes blondes. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so social media stuff, dating apps, all that kind of thing. This is more of the same. Another um, social media app, this one, a Chinese one and the individual who, I mean, we just, again, sorry, dude, um, but we picked you and, <laughs> and we're, we could see all the images he was posting to this app and like there's his dorm room or whatever and like it just, you know, yikes. I do realize though also, um, I didn't put a slide in here for the one, we did have more webcams too, too that came across and we yeah, could see like, uh, like people's cats and their litter box or whatever and different There's things. Weird like, pet feeders are always. Please, whatever apps you're using, just go and don't you clap louder than us. You know what you have to do. Um, so when it's time, just that's that. I, oh, that I, guy. I, I, ow! 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 Yeah, baby! Oh my gosh, this is gonna be so expensive. I'll get you drinks later. Um, <laughs> okay, so, and then um, last but not least, again, and this one is of a really sensitive nature. This is an application to monitor your kid, right? So this is one of those like, hey, I've got some type of, um, you know, Android device and it has an application on it that lets me see the GPS location of my child and we could see that child on a map. In so don't use untrusted things. Don't trust them even if you're supposed to. Look at the number of reviews on that particular one and we will let them know that we can see everything. Whenever we see something like this, we do inform the organization that is affected by it. Um, but that's a lot of positive reviews for something that tells anybody with Wireshark where your child is. So please, please, please. Um, look at your data, look at the wire, um, and see what is out there. Thanks. Yay. Yes! <laughs> oh, I love you guys. Oh. Oh, I, we, we do have time, so questions are always fun and interesting that we get, so you can either yell and we'll repeat or come up to a mic, but there's gotta be some questions. There always is. People are coming in. People are coming. You got people to come in. No. <laughs> That's amazing. What are we missing? Uh, FOMO is real. Um, okay. Does anybody have a question? Yeah, like I said, microphones here. Actually, I do. Um, I know you said you have like malware sandboxing now. Did you see anything really cool? And do you plan on eating any of that to like the malware research community? Yes, so, um, so yes, we always see something cool. Sometimes at, at shows we see new things for the first time, like people must save them up and bring them here. Um, the team from Cisco does an incredible job documenting when they find things like that and they write up excessively long <laughs> um, papers about them. Like, Jessica will send me something and be like, hey, will you review this real quick? That's another thing, like with the partners, like we make sure that they all mention each other in any communication that they have. This is a team effort, but no communication about what takes place on the Black Hat Network goes out without Bart or I's approval. So Jessica will send me something and be like, hey, will you look at this? The one I got after Asia was 54 pages. <laughs> and I was like, I have a job. <laughs> So, um, so yes, the stuff that we find is, is written up and then, um, and then again, it's, it's put out there for, for people to gain something from. And I'll say to some extent, Threat Grid actually, we, did we, is it all private or is some of that? Okay, never mind, I lied to you. Okay. So they do a lot of that where you can mix it and it's, we create all those samples to private though just for PII reasons and that kind of stuff. But Threat Grid does allow you to play with some of that if you have subscription and it was public, but we don't. <laughs> So are you doing any monitoring of uh, other networks that are in the area, like somebody runs their hotspot or something? Are we monitoring all the other networks? So we are not, we are definitely paying attention for rogue APs. Um, there's some things that pop up and we've had interesting use cases in the past where somebody created like a uh, $5 PCB board with a AA battery that it was just a D off machine that they went and threw around in the conference and that was a pain in the ass to go find. Um, but it means free stuff. I mean, I don't <laughs> care how cheap it is. I like free stuff. 
generally, I mean, we've found rogue APs. We do monitor for that kind of stuff, but I would say normally it's just people trying to run their own network because it must be more secure and faster than anything else that we can do. So we have to go kind of chase that down to keep the spectrum clear, but that's the biggest thing that I would say from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. More questions? One back there. Are you going to yell or is there a microphone? I can't see. You can see. yell it and I'll repeat it or you can um, use a microphone. On the topic of rogue APs, DOS, that sort of thing, has there been any thought on moving to an 802.1x model for authenticating us to the Wi-Fi? We have absolutely thought about it, and this goes back decades. Uh, it's been conversed, but... Um, you want to install something I give yeah, you? Yeah, I was going to say, if you're going to install a certificate on your machine for us here at Black Hat... Then we, we did try at one point, and we were laughed right off of the network. We, we like, have I'm in not, the past... I'm not clicking on anything you send me. We're like, it was two separate it. networks, so if somebody wanted to be secure, they could do that, but everybody laughed at it. Yeah, but nobody got on it, so... But if you're willing to install certificates that I push, then let's talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come see us. We got something for you. Who else? There's more than that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. If you don't ask a question, I'll throw one in that we get um, fairly often. So quick? Ooh, I don't know. I actually didn't pull it up. So quick, the no. Google. Did anybody, Spooner, Jessica, anybody see quick? I don't have. They saw it, but they didn't get stats. Sorry, don't have the stats. Tons. All right. Any other questions? All right. I'll, one Walking question. Up, no, coming up. Oh, somebody's coming up. Yeah. Any Flipper Zero related excitement? I mean, we have a lot. I was going to say the knock was full of Flipper <laughs> Zeros. Like we were going up. You know what to do. You know what to do. <laughs> yeah. How dare they? How dare they? Oh, my gosh. You're the best. You're the best. Um, you're our people. You can all come to the knock next year. No, <laughs> um, it would be in this room. 603 gigs a quick. We just found it. There you go. 603. Gigs. I don't know s s percentage, but 603 gigs. Um, so uh, a question that we often get is, do we ever have to alert law enforcement or anything like that? So really quickly, I'll say that yes, we have had to do that in the past. In the past, we've had speakers removed from their hotel rooms because they were doing something from the hotel. We've had to alert the MGM who owns Mandalay Bay to that there were people planning to use different devices or different attacks out on the casino floors, um, that type of thing. And we, um, we have a meeting actually every day with this property, and it's actually not All the property. just this property. So just as I mentioned how the, um, the NOC has a bunch of partners in it who normally compete with one another for the time frame of security summer camp, all of the different gaming properties get together and share intelligence with one another. They talk about what types of attacks they're seeing. They talk about you know, what's happening in their hotels. Um, the FBI is on that call. Local law enforcement is on that call. And it's just an opportunity for everybody to say, what are you seeing? They tell us if they're seeing something that maybe we need to be on the lookout for, and we do the same. So it is a, a nice opportunity um, to share intelligence and just say like, yeah, you know, this is what we're seeing. Keep keep your eyes peeled. Um, I will say that they did fix something this year that's been a problem for me for years, and it always was a little thorn in my side. When they changed the elevators, and if you've been coming here for years, <laughs> but they changed the elevator so you could go to only your floor, it's so annoying, because it's like, now I have to have a room key for every one of my friends I want to go visit. And, but for years, you could just take the little plastic cover off the top of where you tapped your key, and you could swipe your thumb across it if it was a little sweaty. Um, and warm, and you just wipe it across those test pins that are underneath that plastic cover. Goodbye, covers, because now you're all going to go rip them off. Um, but it would fail open, so it would flash green, and you could go to any floor. So we just would swipe our thumb across it and go to whatever friend's floor we wanted to go to. Um, this year, they fixed that. If you do that, it flashes blue, and you can't get to it. But at the time when that happened, the first year we were here, it's immediately what I did. I ripped the cover off, and I, I was like, test connections, and I started playing with it. And when I realized, oh, it fails open, I took a six second video of me swiping my thumb across it, it going green and me pushing other floors, and then I tweeted it. And when I tell you that within moments of that tweet, my phone rang, <laughs> and it was the head of MGM security, and he was like, grifter, what are you doing, man? And he's like, 
I thought you were one of us. And I said, I am one of you, but I'm also one of them. So that's it. We got to get out of here. Okay. Yes, go one more time. They're gone. They're already gone. We don't have to do it. All right. You guys are amazing. We love you. Yeah, thank you. thank you so much. If you have questions we didn't get to, or you think of something, or you're just shy or whatever, come up and chat with us. We'll be around for a few minutes, and then we got to go pack this network up and get over to DEF CON. See you over there. <laughs>